Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Anthony. This is my friend Stacy. We are so excited that you joined us today for Real Life Church's worship service. We have an incredible service ready to go for you. Awesome message about to come your way. But right before that, go ahead and grab a cup of coffee if you are not driving a vehicle and get ready for some awesome worship together. We'll see you right back here in a moment.
far be it from me to not be Even when my eyes can't see And this mountain that's in front of me Will be thrown into the midst of the sea Yeah, and to it all music play and preparing to listen to this sermon that the peace of God is not a fiction but is a real thing and you can experience it whether you have before and feel now that the storms of life have removed that peace from you or taken you out of that peace or if you've never felt it before it is available to you for the asking 
God loved you first, and he runs after you. And all you have to do is stop and say, I surrender. I accept your gift of grace. So let me pray for you now. May you experience the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. May you open your heart, your mind, your soul to receive it. And may you be overwhelmed by the goodness of God as you take that step of faith to allow him in. And God, we thank you that you are so real and you are so wonderful and that you do thrill us, Lord, with that love that you have for us. Thrill hearts and minds in this very moment, Lord. And thank you for this time that we've been able to spend worshiping you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome back. Thank you to our worship team that is amazing, and we are so thankful for you. We are excited about the things that are happening in the life of the church as well as worship, but things that are coming up are... So in just a few weeks, so on the 10th, uh, we are launching our brand new Glendora campus. Uh, if that is not already on your calendar, mark it. If you've been watching from home, waiting for a time to like check out Real Life on a Sunday morning, we would love to see you on the 10th as we launch that new campus. If you know someone who lives near that location, invite them. Uh, let them know you're going to be there. Nine o'clock is when that service is. And uh, I'll be there. I'm excited to see you there. And then the week after that, more parties, right, Stacey? Absolutely. And just to, not that you would be confused, but the 10th and opening at Galindora is there will be two locations happening at one time. So you're welcome at Valley Center, but you're also welcome at Glendora. We'd love to see you at either one if you're ready in per person. And then the next week, the 17th, is the best party of the year. I mean, second to VBS. We'll talk about that later. Easter is coming, and we are so incredibly honored, humbled, amazed that we get to celebrate that Jesus conquered death. And if you want to know more about that, if you are ready to talk about what that looks like to celebrate with us, email us, let us know. We are going to be um, celebrating, singing. We're going to be baptizing people that day. If you think that that's you, but you haven't quite confirmed it, email us. If you've been thinking about it and you haven't told us yet, if you've been praying about it, praying about who you're going to invite, email us. Easter is going to be a party. It's going to happen at both locations, 9 and 11, which is going to sound confusing because Glendora is only at 9. There's all kinds of information. So but when you invite a friend to Easter, make sure you tell them if you're going to be at Glendora or Valley Center or watching online at 10. And then also tell them if you'll be there at 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock. When your friends show up, it's helpful if they see your face. So make sure you name where you're going to be and what time you're going to worship with us on Easter. Absolutely. And speaking of baptisms, we talked about there are some coming up on Easter. And this last week, we baptized super sweet, amazing Brody Ray Boyd. Yeah, he Brody Boyd. I think his picture's amazing. probably up on the screen right now. Yes, and his family was here. It was an incredible moment and day, and we are so incredibly honored to get to celebrate that milestone with that family. We get to pass the faith on to the next generation and invest in young families because of your generosity. We just want to say thanks for stepping into generosity with us as we uh, take the gospel to the world. Yesterday, we had an amazing day at our food pantry. Uh, and again, all those things happen because of your gifts, your tithes and offerings. If you've never given to the church before, it's pretty easy. There's a link in the comment section, or you can just go to reallife.la slash give. If you give regularly, you already know how to do that. And we thank you for it. Stace, I think the message is about ready to go. Yep. So get ready to learn. We'll see you back here in just a moment.
Hey, well, good morning, Real Life Church. Welcome to Real Life Online. If it's your first time joining us, welcome. My name is Raul Herrera. I am the Student Ministries Director here at Real Life Church. It's been an incredible two years here at Real Life. Uh, most of you might know this if, you, if you're new with us. I moved from Michigan about uh, two years ago in August of 2020, a perfect time to move to California. But being at Real Life has been absolutely incredible. And I want to say thank you to our lead pastor, Jim Miller, and our executive pastor, Anthony Prince, for allowing me to step into this role to share with you guys this morning what, uh, what the Lord has put in my heart with all of us today. Um, it's been really cool seeing all the things that we get to do as the church. Uh, you might know this, again, if you're new with us, this is something really cool we like to share, but about last year, we were actually gifted an entire preschool and another campus. And so it was really cool seeing Jim Miller, our lead pastor, kind of in his leadership say, hey, we are going to take this on. We, we want to help this church. And it's been cool seeing us step into that, us as a church, as real life, and serve those preschool families, serve the community. And yesterday, we actually had our food distribution, food pantry there. So thank you so much. If you're serving on that team, if you're praying for us, uh, we would love to partner with you. You can always email us like Anthony and Stacy were saying before this started. Uh, em email us info at reallife.com. LA. Something I get to be a part of here at Real Life is the student ministry program. So I'm working with sixth graders all the way to 12th graders and sometimes helping them transition into the college years. And that's been my passion. I've been in youth ministry for the last 10-ish years. I started when I was around 16 years old. So do the math. That's how old I am now. Um, I started when I was 16 years old in youth ministry, and it's been absolutely an honor and a joy. Typically on Sunday mornings, I'm actually hanging out with middle schoolers. I get to run and facilitate a middle school program here at our Valley Center campus and soon at our Glendora campus as well. Um, and so every Sunday morning, I hang out with middle schoolers, and we have some incredible adult leaders who serve there as well. I know Stacy Travisano, uh, who's our kids director, and myself truly mean this. If you are looking to join a team, we would love to talk to you. What would that look like serving on the kids ministry or with students. Uh, we're always looking to expand our teams. But it's been a lot of fun serving with middle schoolers. There's always this like overarching themes that teenagers talk about ever since we were teenagers in our series on Sunday mornings. And I'll kind of name a few. Dating, dating, some more dating. And then we get onto like other topics about apologetics and theology. And then a couple months ago, we started this new series in our Sunday morning program here at Valley Center about forgiveness. And the title was, you know, try to think something trendy and cool, a bittersweet. But we were talking about forgiveness, this idea of how God is calling us into forgiveness. And something I love about Pastor Jim's teaching, the way he teaches, is he doesn't ask or doesn't tell us this is what we have to do. He really investigates scripture in the Bible and, see, and, and asks the question, why is God asking us to do this? So today, I want to spend the next couple moments here together with our time together here on Sunday morning or whenever you're watching, wherever you're watching from, asking this question, why is God calling us into a life of forgiveness and how can we step into forgiveness? Because Jesus... It's calling us into a new life, a life where we can let go and forgive. And because he canceled our debts and not us, we can in turn cancel others' debts and not the person. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much that you are here in this place. What a testament to your, to your love for us. 2,000 years later, we gather, whether you're at another campus, online, God, and we can hear your word. We can hear what your heart has for us. So, Lord, I ask that you open up our minds, open up our hearts to what you're speaking to us this Sunday morning. And, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So the text we're looking at is actually going to come from Matthew chapter 18, uh, starting at verse 21 all the way to 35. So if you're new to opening a Bible, if you have your notes, if you're trying to open up the app and also watch at the same time, I'm not really sure, maybe pull up the sermon on a iPad or YouTube or something like that. But Matthew 18, 21 to 35, it's in the first book of the New Testament. We're looking at a scripture and something I love about Jesus. There's a lot of things I love about Jesus, but one of the main things I love about Jesus is his storytelling because he gets me. I don't know about you guys, but I really convey the message or I really, I can understand a topic or, or, or an idea through storytelling. And I think Jesus really recognizes how we perceive story, how we perceive the human experience by telling us stories. So here's Jesus about to tell this parable. And a parable basically is a short story that conveys this, this grander idea, this, this gospel truth, this wisdom truth, and gives us practical ways to understand it. Because you've been there. I know you've been there. Like I said, we all, we all think differently. 
but you have been there, whether it's listening to a story or watching a movie, you put yourself in the good person's shoes. You put yourself in the character's shoes, and Jesus recognizes this is how he perceives story. So he's here about to tell one of his disciples, Peter, a story. And like I said, if you watch the new, the new Batman movie, you probably walked to the movie theater thinking like, I am vengeance, I am Batman. You put yourself in the character's shoes, and Jesus knows this. So here's Peter one of his disciples um, who asks him a question. And so prior to this question about forgiveness, Peter's no stranger to the topic of forgiveness. He's actually heard Jesus preach about this topic a couple of times. In fact, prior to this moment we're going to read together in chapter 18, Jesus was actually teaching Peter and his disciples and us, the church, how to pray. And you've probably heard the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. And part of that prayer has this verse in there in Matthew 6, 21. As he's teaching them how to pray, he brings up, forgive, forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And this is a essential tenet to the Lord's Prayer about how we need to forgive others as Jesus has forgiven us first. So Peter is well aware of this topic of forgiveness, and he's like, okay, I've heard about forgiveness. I know what Jesus is saying, how we need to forgive others, and the Lord has forgiven us. He's getting it. He's, he's, the wheels are turning. You know, that's what I like to say. He's like, okay, but I have another question. And so he presents Jesus with this incredible question. He says, in verse 21, we're picking up in Matthew 18, he says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And really quick, I want to stop. He uses the up to seven times because at the time, uh, these people called the Pharisees, the religious leaders, actually kind of like had this weird system already set up for how many times religiously you're allowed to forgive someone. So he knew that information. So it comes to Jesus with it and asks him that question. And in 22, Jesus says, I tell you not seven times, so not what the people were saying before, but 77 times. And that's verse 22. And some translations will say 70 times sending. For you mathematicians, that's 490. I had to do the math on my iPhone. But it's 490. So I don't think Jesus, I don't believe Jesus says this big number, 490, to kind of say, okay, like after those many times, then you don't have to forgive them. I think he's giving this big number because back then they didn't have smartphones to keep notes on their phone. I think he was giving this, this, this astronomical number of 490 because it's not about the record keeping. It's not about how many times. It's about the why we forgive, why God is calling us into a life of forgiveness. So Jesus knows this and gives this crazy number because it's kind of like a, a, the shock, you know, the, the sticker. You're like, wow, 490? What do you mean by that? And so picture how difficult life would be if we physically kept record on a piece of paper or on our phones digitally, we kept record of the times people have done us wrong. We would be walking around with this massive 45 terabyte of storage on us. We'd be carrying around this wheelbarrow of all the records of people who've done us wrong. Jesus recognizes that and said, it's not about how many times. It's about why we should be giving in the first place. So Jesus, the amazing storyteller that he is, gives us this awesome parable story where there's characters and there's a, there's a conflict and there's, there's a story arc. And so here's Jesus about to tell us an incredible story about forgiveness. In verse 23, he starts, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like this, a king who wanted to settle the accounts with all of his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, me and the students would call that major bag alert, 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay the massive debt, the master ordered that he and his wife and all of his children and all that he owed be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. So you might be thinking, wow, that, that king was being rough right away, like to, to throw him and throw his wife and sell all this stuff away. But at the time, that king had every right, according to the law at the time, to do that to sell off him and his wife and all his belongings and foreclose everything because he couldn't pay back this debt. So he's reached with this massive resolution of like, you cannot pay back this massive debt. So you, you deserve, this is what you get. This is the justice you deserve. I'm going to throw you into jail. And it sounds pretty rough. But then we see the mercy this king in the story has for this servant. 
he falls down to his knees and he's begging him, please forgive me, please, I will, I will pay it back, just give me some more time. And we see this awesome, this awesome arc where the king says, you know what, that is okay. And this king did not have to do this. And Jesus, spoiler alert, 99.99% of the time when Jesus is telling us a parable to us, the church now, and there's a king presented in the story, 99.99% of the time, the king represents God. And so if a king in the story represents God, where does that put the servant? Sometimes it might be us. You know, we might be thinking, that's not me. Sometimes in the character story, Jesus is telling this because he knows the truth of the gospel. He knows the truth that we hear in Romans chapter 6, 23. It says this, the wages of sin is death. The debt of our sin, the debt of our unforgiveness, of our hurting, of our anger, of our aggression, the debt, the wages of those sins is death. But here's what Jesus knows while he's telling the story, the incredible storyteller that he is. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So Jesus recognizes this truth and is telling the story with the characters, telling us the gospel truth through the story. And the story continues after the servant was let go and the king showed him mercy. It continues in verse 28. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins and grabbed him and began to choke him. Man, Jesus is like just giving all of all the details. I love it. But pay back everything you owe, he demanded. The fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. So Jesus is painting this awesome picture where you can see prior to this, the servant who also was doing this to the king is now receiving the same action to him. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me. I will pay it back. But he refused. Verse 30, he refused and said he went off, had the man thrown into prison until he could pay it back. When the other servants saw this and saw what happened, they were outraged, rightly so, and went and told their master everything that has happened. Then the master called in the servant and said, you wicked servant, I canceled all of your debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you have shown the mercy to your fellow servant just as I have shown unto you? Verse 34, in anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back everything he owed. Okay, so in the story, you know, we put ourselves in character's shoes and we're hearing the story that Jesus is conveying about this really bad guy because he was just forgiven this massive debt, one of the biggest debts, like 10 million bags of coins, something crazy, this huge debt, and was just freely pardoned of it. The king showed him mercy and said, hey, even though you owe me this and you deserve justice, it's okay. And he in turn turns around and chokes out one of his fellow co-workers over a couple hundred bucks. Like, this is not a good guy. So when, they, when, when the other servants saw this and they told on him, you might be thinking what I was thinking is like, yeah, that's what he deserves. That's what he gets. That's what's fair. He rightfully deserves to be thrown into jail because he literally should have been thrown into jail. And now here he is doing the same thing to someone else that he knows. You might be like, man, this is great. Go off, king. You're, you're doing a great job. This man deserves it. So up until that point, you might be thinking what I was thinking. You might be thinking all those things. And so far, so good that just as it been served and he deserved that. But then here's where Jesus tells us this massive truth that is really hard to hear sometimes. He continues in verse 35. This is how my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive your brothers and sisters in your heart. We all want mercy. We all want forgiveness, give me a second chance, I didn't know any better, I'm sorry it won't happen again. We all desire mercy, but when it comes time to giving it back to other people, it can be really, really, really hard. I recognize that, I see that, and I know that's true. So when Jesus calls us into a lifestyle of forgiveness, into a life of forgiveness, a new life, it can be really hard to understand that truth and to also practice it. Because when you and I receive God's forgiveness as Christians, as Christ followers, through Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven, we have to respond. We have to echo and produce and distribute that mercy that he has given to us so freely. Just like Romans was saying, God forgave us of our sins. The wages, the debt of our sins was death, but God, through Jesus, did not cancel us. He canceled our debts. Jesus did not cancel us. He canceled our debts. So how can we cancel others' debts and not the person? 
like I said, when I was preparing for this message, I always think about, I take some time to think about, you know, almost every single morning, whether it's for a minute, it's for an hour, 45 minutes, I ask the Lord, what do you have for me to speak on for all of us this Sunday morning? And so I actually was taking uh, kind of the theme that we were talking about in our middle school program a couple months ago on this forgiveness journey, because I too was in a season where forgiving was very, very difficult. And I thought, man, how funny is that? I keep asking God what he wants me to talk about. And here I am preaching about forgiveness to middle schoolers and really struggling to forgive someone in the situation. And so I was like, what better topic to speak on today? So as you know, like I said, I moved out to California. And so I had to sell my car and I had to buy a really, like, a really cheap like beater with like rust from Michigan. I had it shipped out here to California. And I drove that thing like it was a sports car, all legal, of course, like it was a sports car for the last two years. And so finally, repair after repair, the power steering went out and I could no longer afford the, the cost of repairing it was over the value of the car. So I was like, all right, it's time to get rid of the blue cookie monster, as some of the middle school girls call it, the blue cookie monster. So I sold it. Keep in mind, this is going into the new year. I miss Christmas. Wham, wham, wham me. I miss New Year's. I was super sick. I was recovering from, a, from an illness I had. I still wasn't 100%. I was selling my car. I was trying to buy a new car. So I was already stressed out. I was already, I was not having it. Every single day I was like, Jesus, what is going on right now? Uh, so I finally found this car. I, I talked to the person who was selling it, and you know, they told me everything was okay. I test drive it. They, they were showing me around, and I was trying to evaluate it from the things I know about cars, the very limited amount of time and uh, information I know about cars. And I said, okay, I, I'm trusting you. You know, this car you said is going to last me. I, I need to drive this to work every day. I want to take road trips. Will this car last me? Like, yes, this car will last you. You know, don't check engine light. And I said, okay, finally, I, gotta, I have to take a leap of faith. And so I went out. I took out a big amount of money from the bank from the money that God has allowed me to steward well and save the last two years here. Um, and I paid for this car. And I kid you not, like a movie, I get on the freeway, and it was one thing after another, after another, after another, like check engine light. And it was overheating and smoke coming from the back. And I literally was driving, and the wheel was shaking because the car was sputtering up the road. And I was like, Jesus, you've got to be kidding me right now. What is happening? I literally was like, out loud, I was like, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. And I pulled over. And instantly, like, I'm, the body, I'm, the memory's still there. You know, God has helped me recover from this. But I was, like, shaking because I was like, man, I, I feel wronged. I feel cheated. I feel manipulated. I, I'm angry right now. And in that moment, I, uh, the car sputtered to a parking lot. And I called someone to give me legal advice. And I said, I want to sue this person who sold me this bad car because they told me it was good. And I'm going to take them to court. And, man, they did me wrong. And they deserve justice. And this is not right. And this is not fair. And so I kept driving home little by little. And I was still shaking and I was still angry and I got, to the, my, I got to my driveway and I was just sitting there with like looking back with just this like exuding just like furious anger just spiraling out of control. And I tried walking into my house and I literally took two steps and I just fell to the ground. And I knew it wasn't anything like a medical emergency. I knew exactly what was happening. There's this famous quote that we've probably all heard of that talks about unforgiveness. And it says, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. I was feeling it. And so doing, you know, the research beforehand, knowing I was going to speak today about this topic of forgiveness in my situation we've, we, we go through, um, I did some research and I found an, an article by Dr. Amir Poor. Uh, and he, he's, a, he's a professor at the New York Medical College, and he wrote in this article, he said about unforgiveness. He said, unforgiveness, holding on to grudges, unforgiveness can have some major health effects. You don't say. I was really feeling it that day. Major health effects, anywhere from cardiovascular to your breathing to your sleep to your immune system can get shot. He has... He has stated that there are studies showing that when you hold on to grudges, when you hold on to unforgiveness, it can have a massive effect on your health. And so I thought, as I was laying there in anger, I thought, man, I was wronged. This isn't fair. How can I still feel these things? How can I still think these things when I know the truth of the gospel, when I know that Jesus has forgiven me, so then I must in turn forgive others around me? And there's a verse in Matthew 6, 15, the same one we were reading before. It says, but if you not, do not forgive others of their sin, your father will not forgive you of your sins. Kind of the parable that Jesus was talking about. The message version actually says this, which I really like. It says, in prayer, there's a connection between what God is doing and what we do. You cannot get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from what God is doing. 
the longer I've walked with Jesus, the more I realize this thing. And it's really hard for me to understand early on, but the more I go through situations, the more I lean into what God is calling me to do, I realize something. Yes, we are commanded by God, our Father, to do these things, but we don't have to do them. We don't have to do them. What do I mean by that? We can see the brokenness in the world all around us, the hurt and the pain that we, we can cause. And so when God tells us these things, when God calls us to live a life of forgiveness, a live a life that, that responds to his mercy, it's because he desires, rather not because we have to, but because he desires for us to live a life that is healthy, a life that is in unity, a life that is pure, a life that is holy, a life that is healthy. God desires for that so much. So he sent his son Jesus in our place to take our ransom, our debt, in love and in mercy. And so we get to live in that lifestyle. We get to choose in free will these things that God is calling us into because he cares for us and wants the best for us. That's why he tells us this thing. That's why when we know things like he canceled our debts and not us, we in turn can respond to others and say, okay, I know that's the truth. How can I cancel others' debts and not the person? Now I want to stop right here because usually at this point, in the middle school or high school uh, sermon, uh, one of the students will come up to me afterwards or even during the sermon, uh, and they'll be like, Rauliano is one of, one, of the, one of the students calls me that. Rauliano, I get it. I've been in church my whole life. I've gone to VBS. This all makes sense to me. Jesus forgave me. That's how they say it. Jesus forgave me, so I got to forgive other people. And I'm like, yeah, awesome. You get it. High five. See you next week. And they go, no, no, no. I have a question. I'm like, okay, yes. How do I do that? And I was like, e, uh, that's the question. Uh, let, me, let me get back to you next, next week. How do we do that? Because you might be thinking what they're not afraid to tell me. I know that's the truth. I know Jesus forgave me, so I must forgive others. But how do we do that? I want to be really just transparent and say that I've been on this journey of processing um, unforgiveness and trauma with professionals, and it's been really incredible to see the tools and resources that comes from that place in the last decade. Um, the taboo around uh, mental health and trauma and forgiveness has really changed in the church culture, and so I'm so thankful that that's something real life is not afraid to talk about. That's something real life actually helps me um, get, and so as I've been preparing and praying and looking at scripture and God calling us into forgiveness, I actually had a conversation with one, uh, a professional I actually see, and we actually found kind of common ground on one of the main reasons I think it's so hard for us to be, to, to unforgive, to not show forgiveness, to, to have uh, unforgiveness in our lives. One of the main reasons why it can be so hard for us to show forgiveness is because we are still hurt. We are still hurt. There is, it isn't that I just get mad. It isn't that I just hold on to a grudge to people. It's that there's something that I haven't dealt with from my past that when that thing happens, when someone does me wrong, it triggers this automatic uh, fight response, this, this defensive response in us that has not been dealt with before. And we have not approached that trauma, that hurt, to our two physicians. When I say two physicians, I mean one. The first one is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the good physician. He has come for the sick. He tells us in Mark 2, chapter, in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, he says, I have not come. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Jesus wants to heal you both physically, spiritually, and mentally. Jesus has come. This is right before he paralyzed. This is right after he paralyzed a man who could not walk. Jesus has come to this earth and has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit because he desires to heal you. He desires to strengthen you. Jesus is the first person we should go to through the Holy Spirit who can help us overcome those past traumas. The second is actual professionals. We find healing in our community of the church. When I say the church, I don't mean real life. I don't mean another campus. I mean the church as the church body, as the global church, as the Acts church. We need to reach out to our community as well, whether that's through a physician, whether that's through a psychiatrist, whether that's through a counselor. God is calling us into healing in our community as well. So what is what forgiveness is not? Forgiveness is not something we can do alone. Trying to forgive others is, is us throwing up our hands and saying, I can't do this alone anymore. I need a savior. I need Jesus to cancel the person's debt and not the, to cancel the person's debt and not the person. So one last thing I want to leave you with is to help you to step into that 
is what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not trying to trust the person. Forgiveness and trust are two separate things. Pastor Rick Warren talks about this really, really, really well. He says, when the Bible commands us to forgive someone, it has to be an instant decision. We have to make a choice. But the trust process takes time. It takes time for us to trust people. There's a tool I left with my students that I want to leave to you guys. And so if parents, if you heard this in your house, it's because I've been giving it to your students. I want to preface this really quick. I will say things to them. I will say, it's okay not to forgive. And you're probably thinking, Raul, you just spent the last half hour talking about forgiveness. Why are you saying it's okay not to forgive? But I follow up with this. I say, it's okay not to forgive right now. You can tell that person, that sibling, that spouse, that coworker, you can tell them in peace, you know, go to Jesus first and tell them, I can't forgive you right now because I'm still hurt, because I'm still angry. So there I was on the ground, um, you know, processing the unforgiveness I had for this person who sold me this car that was not working out for me and all the stress that, and in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the stress, I thought of the bumper sticker question, what would Jesus do? You know, the cliche thing I've heard since I was a kid, the wristbands and bumper stickers. What would Jesus do? And I knew the answer. I knew what Jesus would do because he did it for me. He forgave me. And so when I knew the answer, I realized I can't do that. <laughs> I can't do that. So now what? And so I just laid there on my back. And then I remember this, this, um, this book I read by this amazing uh, American philosopher named um, Dallas Williard. And um, it comes from one of his books called The Spirits of Discipline. And in that book, he talks about the idea of asking the question instead, this isn't my thought, a question instead of what did Jesus do? What did he do? Not what would he do in this situation, but what did he do? Going back to scripture and referencing what did Jesus do in these moments? So just like Jesus, I turned around on my face and I just prayed. And that is step number one for forgiving others, praying. What a profound message that Jesus gave us to, to love our enemies. That is insane. I love sharing that with people who might, you know, still figure out who Jesus is. And they're like, I can never do that. I'm like, yeah, me neither. It's crazy to think that Jesus calls us into a life to forgive those who don't deserve it. And God does these things because he did it for us first. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I turned around. I was referencing. I was like, I know Jesus and the moments before his death on the cross for us took some time to pray. So I turned around and I started to pray. And the emotions didn't go away. I was still angry. I was still upset. I was still hurt. But in the midst of all of that, in the midst of the chaos, through prayer, I found peace. And it's really hard to explain, but when we find this peace, when our first response, the choice we have to make is forgive those because we know the truth, God will start to align his promises in our life to cancel the debt and not the person because Christ Jesus canceled our debts and not us. So the next morning, you know, going against all the legal advice and my emotions and everything I had planned to do, I actually drove, I called the person first and actually drove back. And just, hey, I need to come back to you really quick. I have some, you know, have some things I want to talk about. And I was like, on the whole way there, I was like, Jesus, I don't want to yell at this guy. Jesus, I don't want to yell at this person. Jesus, help me to speak words of you. And I'm just asking God to step into that, to not cut myself off from the process of uh, forgiveness. And I got there and I explained the situation. And the person apologized. They offered to fix practically everything almost for free. They offered me their personal vehicle so I could use while I was working that day. But I actually chose not to. And I said, Lord, if you called me back into this, this, this position, uh, why? And so I actually stayed at the place where the car was being fixed the whole day and talked to him about his son and his daughters. And I got to pray for his daughter. And I got to pray for his son. And I actually got to meet his son. And he reminds a lot of me so I could see why he was, you know, trying to make sure I was okay. And I thought back, you know, I don't like thinking about it. And I thought back, how awful would have that situation have been if I just let my emotions control me? If I just let the unforgiveness and the justice he rightly deserved to, to, to you know, put them to, to go class action, whatever you, want, whatever you want to think of, I'm like, how awful would have that been? And I got to share the gospel truth with him and his family. 
And that was a choice that Jesus calls us into because it's still really hard to do. When we're there with the moment, acknowledge your hurt. I can't forgive you right now. This really hurts. I'm really angry, but I want to step into that because Jesus is calling us into a new life. So when you're in those moments, you can think, what did Jesus do? He canceled our debts and not us. Even when we didn't deserve it, even when we didn't ask for it, and even when we don't feel like it sometimes, we have to respond in the same mercy that Jesus has given us to others. Through community, through prayer, through fasting, and most importantly, through Christ Jesus' truth and his word and his love for us. Living that life is a reflection of God's mercy, and you will start to see God's mercy exude more and more and more, not only in your life, but the lives around you as we connect ourselves more through prayer with God. Jesus is the only way to receive forgiveness. We can't do anything. We cannot achieve anything. There's no religious tools to get to God's forgiveness. It's a free gift given to us. And as we pray, as we think about how we can cancel people's debts and not them, as we pray, I want to think about those people who might be listening to this or watching wherever you're from who are waiting to forgive maybe themselves or someone else but aren't quite ready yet to step into that decision with Jesus and say, I want to press towards a life of forgiveness that Jesus has called me into because, Lord, you have forgiven me first. So let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much, God, that you took on our debt. You took on all of our sin and our anger and the grudges we hold against people, and you took them freely and lovingly and put them on the cross for us. And Lord, through your resurrection, you have conquered death in the grave. So Father, we thank you for that truth. We thank you for your mercy. And God, help us to step into community, to stop, to take moments that you have shown us in prayer, to forgive others first as you have forgiven us so freely, Lord. We recognize it's a hard process and we cannot do this alone. And here we are as Christians, as Christ followers, throwing up our hands and saying, Lord, we need you. God, we thank you for your mercy and your grace, Jesus. And Lord, for those who are struggling with unforgiveness, maybe forgiving themselves first. Lord, I pray that today is their first step towards you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us this morning. What a powerful message on forgiveness. Uh, And know this, that as you are called to forgive others, Mm. Jesus has already forgiven you. He doesn't want to cancel you. He wants to cancel your debts. And so we would love to uh, walk with you through your journey of following Jesus. Uh, Reach out to us, info at reallife.la. Let us know how we can best partner with you, walk with you, meet a need in this season. We are here for you. We are cheering for you. Absolutely. And if you have a friend that is desperately in need of hope, in need of hearing this message, in need of being reminded that they are forgiven, that they are loved. You can share this. You can copy paste and share the link. You can tell them exactly which part of the message to listen to. You are so, so thoroughly loved. And we are so thankful for this time that we got with you today. We look forward to hearing from you, continuing to walk with you in the faith. Have a great week. See you next week.